This episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast is presented by Sling. This weekend, you've got plenty of Premier League matches as well as football from Ligue 1 and around the world, and all available through Sling TV. Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast. My name is Christopher Harris. I'm joined today by my co-host, Kartik Krishnaya. For listeners who may not have listened to the World Soccer Talk podcast before, where, where have you been <laughs> for these uh, 17 years? But but no worries if, if, this, if you are new to the World Soccer Talk podcast. Uh, we are now doing a three times a week show. So Mondays and Fridays, uh, Kartik and I discussing some of the, the hot topics uh, from the around, uh, around the world of soccer. And then Wednesdays, we have uh, Kyle Fansler doing an exclusive interview. Uh, this week, it's with uh, Rob Phillips from BBC Radio Wales talking about the, the Wrexham story uh, and more interviews coming in the future. But today, we're going to be discussing and diving deep into MLS Season Pass can it be saved and how to fix it? And I, Kartik, I think we can safely say that MLS Season Pass is right now not in the zeitgeist of soccer watching in the, the United States, uh, at least not yet. Um, the biggest question to me is this. Is MLS Season Pass broken, i.e. has it produced a disappointing number of signups? And if so, how can it be fixed? Now, according to our sources, uh, MLS season pass has not been a runaway success that a lot of people were hoping for. In fact, according to one of your sources, Kartik, there is disappointment even at the club level too. So while Apple nor MLS have released any numbers or metrics, there is a sense that signups for MLS season pass have plateaued. So if the league and tech giants need to boost to get people signing up again, what can they do? And then lastly, before I turn it over to you, Kartik, is what are the issues with MLS Season Pass that need fixing from a 50,000-foot level that are preventing people from signing up? So lots of questions. So where do you want to start this with, uh, Kartik? Well, first off, and this is my fault, uh, maybe I'm not as glued into the real world as maybe I should be. I um I have been stunned by the depth of hostility toward Apple as a company by people who consider themselves soccer fans. Um, I know, I mean, I can understand why people don't like large corporations. I'm that way. I mean, for years, I wouldn't shop at Walmart um, because of their policies towards organized labor. Um, but I, I'm shocked by the just the, the sheer number of people I talk to who say this. And then when I tell them there's a, if they're an Android uh, user, there are these workarounds, which we've documented at World Soccer Talk, they don't care. They frankly are like, we're not giving money to Apple. Well, do you have a problem with uh, uh, the Disney bundle or, or Amazon Prime? Because Amazon, Disney, maybe they're, they're similar large tech companies. No, there's something specific about Apple with uh, people because they're they're seen as a very proprietary company. They're seen as kind of this uh, – I don't I, I don't know how to describe it, elite exclusive company. And I'm hearing this from people who are MLS fans. Uh, I mean, and they had a problem with Red Bull, right? Red Bull, uh, when they bought the Metro Stars. Uh, but they haven't had a problem paying Disney for years uh, for ESPN+. Plus. They haven't had a problem with getting Amazon Prime. Uh, so Apple's in a different category than so, some of these other companies, at least among this group of people. And once you're cutting into your base of MLS fans or soccer fans, which is also already not that big um, in the U.S. People who will actually pay for a soccer product. I'm not talking about people who casually turn on uh, the Women's World Cup final or a U.S. game in the Men's World Cup. I'm talking about people who will actually play, pay for a soccer product. Uh, you're hurting yourself. You know, you're, 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 you're undermining yourself. And so um, there are a bunch of things we need to go through in this podcast, Chris, but I want to register that first because it was something, and again, I blame myself. I did not realize how deep this, uh, this issue was with a lot of people and it's 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 basically dozens of people I've talked to now that feel that way now maybe it's an excuse but it's still something that's registering and I I uh I, I'm surprised yeah this is a tough one it's a great question you raised Kartik because like what other tech giants could have MLS have gone to if they did want to go down that path of streaming and go into a cord cutting solution so Amazon has a lot of, I mean, negativity connotated with that. If they did Amazon Prime, 
video. Amazon's not perfect uh, by any means. They could have gone down the route of Google and uh, Android. And that that's, again, a, a lot of ne- negative connotations among some people there, too. Um, they could have done YouTube TV, um, which is doing, what, the NFL Sunday stuff, uh, which is really expensive. But, I mean, that, that that's one, one way. But I guess in a way, though, too, I mean, if they all went in, all in on Android, and, and this was an Android um, subscription service, then you'd have all the Apple fans just complaining, saying this is not fair. So part of it is the landscape, the environment. Where... But, 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 but wait a second. I, I don't agree with that because YouTube is a Google product. And I think if you stream things on YouTube, you don't get this kind of reaction. Yeah, um, I agree. So, but... that's how, so that's what they would have done. If yeah. they had gone with Google, it would have been on YouTube, I, I believe. Well, I don't know. It might have been YouTube TV, right? So then it's like you're paying – you mean it could be it could be a ninety nine dollar a year plan through YouTube TV and uh, and then they're hoping that you also subscribe to YouTube TV for the, for the you know all the cable channels you're used to, um, yeah YouTube TV YouTube by itself I don't think anyone would have an issue with, but if it was YouTube TV then yeah, obviously there's a cost factor so I I think it's a bigger problem though I think I think the problem is it doesn't have even have anything to do with MLS season pass I don't think so. The actual service itself, if you subscribe to MLS Season Pass, for the most part, it, it's great, right? You've got every game, you've got the uh, no blackouts, you have the the local radio option as a, an option to listen to a different uh, commentators, which no one else offers. Uh, you have MLS 360, which is a great whip-around show. Um, the, the actual, what Apple has done, not perfect, right? There's still issues um, in terms of um, having the fun- there's no app for Android, for example, for Android phones. But what MLS Season Pass is from Apple, I don't think it. I don't think Apple is the issue. Is the reason why people are not subscribing. I, I think it's a bigger issue. But I mean, there has to be a reason to subscribe to MLS Season Pass. And if you're an, an average soccer fan in the United States right now. What are the leagues you're watching the most of, right? It might be Liga Mekis. It might be the Bundesliga. It might be the Premier League. It might be Serie A. But you're basing your choices, your your how much money you're spending or what, what money you're spending on on quality, really. You're, you're wanting to watch the best leagues from around the world at a price that ends up being cheaper than MLS Season Pass, Oh, you mean right? Because Major League Soccer is is the most expensive streaming service out there, and arguably it offers one of the least quality products on the field. So I I, I don't think the problem is is MLS Season Pass. I don't think the problem is Apple, uh, although it does have a factor. I think the root problem is right now MLS is probably in, in a tough spot. I mean, to me, I look at the front office at Major League Soccer and feel that they've let down the league, let down the league in terms of lack of big-name quality signings that would really uh, raise people's eyes, eyebrows to go like, oh, wow, I, I've got to watch this team or this player happen, uh, play in the league. That's going to that's gonna drive me to go ahead and watch those games. And then the second thing, in terms of the, the format of the league and focusing so much on, like, what, 60% of the teams will make the playoffs – Making making the regular season rather meaningless for the most part, other than the first couple of weeks when there's new teams playing at new stadiums. For the rest of the, the regular season, for the most part, up until the playoffs, it's it's the same old issue. And, and Kartik, these are topics we've been talking about for years. This is nothing new, right? I mean, to me, the, the, these two things, quality of MLS has improved, but there's too many teams, which has reduced the actual average quality across the league. And you've got um, a rather meaningless season, right? Nothing, nothing's changed. Um, yeah, I agree on the meaningless season, regular season part completely. I, I do not agree on the quality thing at all. Honestly, I, I, uh, what have been the most popular leagues in the United States, Chris? They've been the Premier League and Liga Amekis. When have those leagues had the top players in the world? When, when has the Premier League, people said they're going to watch the Premier League because they signed X, Y, and Z? I mean, in fact, I mean, this may speak to 
La Liga's poor marketing strategy in this country until recently. They had the top players in the world. They didn't get anywhere near the numbers the Premier League did in this country. Yeah, but you, you've uh, got there to have look. been various times that, that that Serie A had better players and people were watching the Premier League in this country. I, I don't I don't buy that argument at all. And and I have and I'll get in go ahead, but I'll okay, get into it yeah. a little deeper in a minute. I would say and this is not even arguably, but I would say the best player in the world right now is Erling Haaland. You mean lighting up the, the, the Premier League, uh, every game you're watching him play, and this is a player that has, you mean so many, so much talent, uh, scoring so many goals, and he, right now he's playing better than Messi. Messi at, at PSG, you mean they're losing games. Um, you mean PSG on the on the on the field? Messi's not producing as much as as he has done in previous seasons. So you look at Erling Haaland as an example. You look at most of the Brazilian team. Most of the Brazilian national team play in England. Oh, okay, so that might be right now, okay? And I, I don't agree with you, actually. I don't think Holland is the best player in the world. I think there are very few of the top 10 players in the world that are in England right now. That's my opinion. But um, historically, the Premier I mean, there was even a point in 2015, 2016, that the Premier League probably had less big names than MLS. Yes, MLS was signing uh, older guys, Gerard Lampard, uh, Villa, uh, Pirlo, Drogba, etc. Uh, but I, I don't buy that argument. You know, I I've noticed domestically in soccer uh, ambiance and atmosphere and having a good time and having a memorable experience drives fandom more than than who wins and who loses and the quality of soccer. In fact, this isn't meant to be an insult, but maybe it'll come across this way. Many Americans don't actually know, uh, can't actually discern quality from entertainment in terms of football. Maybe that's why the Premier League's so popular. It's more entertaining than Serie A because it's a quicker pace, etc. But I, I think Stadium atmospheres in MLS generally stink. We, we've named those stadiums, the, the clubs that do, do it right. It's mostly newer clubs, right? It's Austin, Nashville, etc. But I think as long as you've got games in Foxborough, <laughs> you have games in, um, in, in in some of these other venues, which are half empty and are uh, lifeless, uh, Pizza Hut or whatever it's called now in Frisco, um, that, that, the, the, the FC Dallas Stadium, Houston, I think that's, that's a bigger problem than quality of play. Uh, in fact, I, I do, but I do agree with you on expansion, right? The quality of MLS gets diluted every year because of expansion. Well, I think that's that's the one thing about MLS 360 is it um, really captures the quality of the league. It, it crystallizes it, right? Because usually on, on, in previous seasons on, on television, we'd have MLS games, sometimes Fridays, but usually Saturday afternoon, Saturday evenings, uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evenings, and many of the games actually on, on a Saturday night would be on the, at the same time on ESPN Plus, which didn't have a whip around show. So I was always trying to figure out, okay, which game is the game to watch? Which w- w- I'm, I'm, I must be missing some of the the, the, the amazing talent or the amazing storylines because I'm just flipping from channel to channel to channel, and I, I I can never quite in the past could never quite find that game that that was really the game to watch. Now that we have MLS 360. In that 7.30 to 9.30 uh, local time um, window on a Saturday night, it really pulls together the whole entire league. So you do get the chances to watch, I mean, six or seven games that are happening at the same time. And, and then they go in the Whip Around show, they go from, from stadium to stadium. Like, hey, here's what happened here. Here's what happened there. Um, for the most part, for me, I mean, having watched this week after almost every weekend since the season has begun, it's made me realize that there isn't that much quality right now uh, in this league. And, and yes, there are moments like this past weekend watching uh, New England against Cincinnati, some of the, seeing some of the skill and how fast pace and, and uh, skillful and technically these team, those two teams were. And you can see why this, those are two of the teams in the Eastern Conference near the top. Um, and then you'd see moments, maybe a Christian uh, Benteke overhead kick for DC United, and see what DC United, United's doing and, and how good that they've turned turned that Wayne Rooney's this season alone has turned that team around. They're playing some really good football, and you can see that they're really enjoying it. But for the most part, watching the games, there's not much really happening. You, you see, kind of a lot of the mistakes. Um, it's it's not a good look. Uh, so so the quality thing i mean and again this is subjective right this is my opinion kind of based on what we're seeing right now um outside of that though too i just don't see much there's not much things that are happening in mls that are newsworthy so 
every day at World Soccer Talk, we're looking for the the next stories to write about. So is it, you mean, Huddersfield Town and Neil Warnock, they stay up after having a, a crazy season, right? Looking like they were gonna, going to get relegated. Warnock comes in, saves them, keep, keeps them up. Uh, you look at Wrexham, which is just skyrocketing, right? You've got CBS uh, News, like you mentioned last week, Kartik talking about it in the morning show. You go down the list. There's so many different things happening from all the different leagues from around the world. Um, so for, for me personally, when I'm watching MLS season pass, and I want MLS to succeed, I want MLS pass to su- succeed. But when I see it firsthand and see how, how disappointing the product is, uh, it makes me realize, okay, this is why. This is why people are not signing up in droves because there's not much happening off the pitch, major signings. On the pitch, It's for the most part, it's not that great. It's okay. You'll see sporadic moments of, of some skill, but it, it's, it's, it's really not that not as good as what, I've, what a lot of MLS uh, writers or fans made it out to be. And MLS 360 is fantastic, such a great idea for the league. But it does, to me, show some of the inadequacies of of Major League Soccer. Uh, I would again say the signings issue I think is, is is not that critical and I think it's more about atmosphere and ambiance but that goes right back to your second point because of the and so your, your complaints about the quality the lack of relevance of these matches Chris the, the the fact that the regular season is virtually meaningless and that I remember the season that Seattle went 10 or 11 matches winless in the middle of the season do you remember this and they ended up winning MLS Cup um uh, that, 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 uh, what, you, what season was that? It would have been 2016, right? 2016, 2017? Uh, one, one of those years. Um, I, I mean, that, that speaks to the lack of um, relevance of the regular season. So I think your, your point about quality, I'm now, as you argued it, I realize you, you're right, actually. And that's all a reflection. May, there isn't the urgency or importance in these matches. I don't think necessarily the quality level is that much lower than some of these other leagues that, that might be getting more attention. Uh, among core soccer fans in the United States. But I do think those matches in the regular season in those leagues matter in a way that the, the matches in this league just simply don't. Um, and uh, not having a promotion and relegation, not having uh, a, a, a playoff format that rewards uh, excellence in the regular season. I mean, it's just, uh, it's all really, uh, a, 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 it feels like it's all really a money grab with the amount of games that take place for no no discernible purpose other than to weed out eight or ten uh, uh, sides. So, uh, yeah, I, I get your point on that. And I think that's where the lack of quality comes in. What does an MLS regular season game in May mean? Well, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything, really, in the bigger scheme of things. I think, uh, no, your, your points are good because, because there's two ways of looking at this. The first way is looking uh, at it as a viewer, as a neutral, someone that, that doesn't have an MLS team to support and is just watching for entertainment or for a skill or looking for watching a, a great game. And as a neutral, I'm not seeing that for the, for the most part. Uh, it's hard to think of any amazing games other than the opening weekend. The opening weekend was fantastic. Lots of kind of last gasp um, goals in the in the, the end of the game, and um, uh, Almeida scoring an incredible uh, free kick for Atlanta United. Opening weekend was fantastic for Major League Soccer. It was really entertaining. So that's one way of looking at it from from a viewing perspective. Is it, it's pretty boring right now. There's really not much that that's really kind of pulling me in, saying like, "Hey, Chris." You have to get excited about this big game coming this weekend. It's, it's, it's a must-watch. But f- on the other side to look at it is from the actual fans at the stadium. And that's really where the, the appeal is. So you look at like teams you mentioned, Kartik, like Nashville, Austin, Atlanta, um, maybe LAFC, um, and St. Louis. Absolutely. So if you're a fan in any of those cities and you're going to those games – what a great experience it is because you're you're you know, you're you're participating in, in the singing and the chanting and the game day experience. It's it's a great night out. It's you I mean it's the tickets are relatively affordable. Uh, you mean it's that is entertaining. So it's almost like you have two different leagues, right? You have a global league where you have which is in competition with you know, Premier League and Serie A and Bundesliga and you mean the Argentine league, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
where you have so much choice. And then the other part of it, the other league is, is the actual league itself, where if you live in St. Louis, that's the, that's the only game in town, right? Although other than baseball, but you I mean that's that's the place to go to to watch games, and there's very little choice, right? If you're a soccer fan in St. Louis, what's the choice? You go see St. Louis City, uh, but maybe there's a local team. I'm not sure, but 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 there's very little choice. But but it's still, you go, you're entertained, you love it, it's fantastic. Um, but the two things don't don't mesh. I mean, you I mean on on a national level. It's not as good as it as it could be or should be. So, like, so quality aside, I mean, and we've seen that there's so far very little interest after the initial uh, bump in in subscribers for MLS season pass in the beginning, and most of the hardcore MLS fans are at the stadiums getting free subscriptions to MLS season pass. So outside of that. You mean mainstream America, sports fans, soccer fans. Um, what can be done to improve MLS season pass to make the viewing experience better or different to get pe- more people to subscribe? So, Kartik, if you're MLS, right, and you're having an internal meeting saying like, hey, what can we do to go ahead and increase the number of subscriptions to MLS season pass? Uh, what would you do? What, what ideas do you have? I I don't know. I mean, short of buying uh, time to put MLS uh, 360 on a, a linear channel or have some sort of highlights program on a linear channel that uh, people actually watch, right? Not, not FS1. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been told by multiple people the lack of sports center highlights and sports center mentions for uh, MLS has really hurt uh, the buzz around the product and people's desire to watch it. And, and uh, uh, look, uh, the, the people who have argued this uh, to me are, 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 are pro MLS people, and, and they uh, they have said, look, uh, Disney is discriminating against MLS because they're no longer a rights holder. But then I point out, well, uh, Sports Center they showed NHL highlights for years when NHL was uh, not on ESPN or any Disney network; it was on NBC. Uh, they showed uh, uh, they show Premier League highlights all the time, which which you know. They, these people actually acknowledge that. They say, well, yeah, well, that's that may be because the Premier League is seen as sexy and you have to keep up with the Joneses. But they show Premier League highlights and Premier League news uh, quite often. Um, now, maybe there's been a deliberate attempt to cut MLS uh, highlights out of the, the Sports Center top 10 every night. Uh, they used to regularly land in those. Maybe, maybe that's uh, maybe that's deliberate on Disney's part. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm speculating here. I'm defending Disney and ESPN. Uh, but uh, they, they, they spent 27 years trying to build up the product. So I, I, I don't quite get the hostility that some MLS people have to Disney and to ESPN, but um, but whatever. That's, I think that's the way they have to fix it. It's like they have to get something in people's faces, a magazine program or a highlights program on linear television. But then again, maybe you're right, Chris, the, the highlights in, uh, aren't compelling enough. Maybe, maybe there is a quality problem then. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an actual solution. All I, all I know is that there is a lot less buzz and, and, and forget soccer Twitter and like American soccer Twitter uh, in the in, in, in the actual soccer community out there, including uh, my my relationships with people in lower division soccer, women's soccer in this country, youth soccer. There's a lot more, a lot less conversation about MLS than there was a year ago. Uh, even among people who work and, 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 and live in the game in this country. So, uh, and that's a direct reflection of Apple Season Pass. And that's where, or MLS Season Pass on Apple. That's where I'm getting a lot of my anecdotal evidence about the Apple situation and, and the cost and all of that from, is from talking to people who are in the game, not just random people who might be uh, fans of the NFL and, and they, they picked a, a, one of the top six Premier League teams to root for because that's, that's, a, that's an in thing. Um, it, we're talking about people who are actually in the game. So I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. So, yeah, when you think about it, I mean, MLS Season Pass is an app within an app. So if you want to go ahead and subscribe to MLS Season Pass, you need to get the Apple TV app. And then within the Apple TV app is um, MLS Season Pass, and you, you can subscribe to that. And, yes, you can go through the website directly and subscribe through there. But you need an Apple ID, even if you hate Apple, even if you're an Android user, even whatever. Everyone has to have an Apple ID. You have to have to create that if you don't have one already. So 
from from the start it is you have to jump through a couple more hoops than you could then you would have to in previous years where you'd switch on fs1 or espn2 or big fox or sometimes abc or even espn plus i mean so it it was a lot more accessible a lot easier to to actually be able to uh yeah, just on a on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, just kind of casually come across an MLS game and, and watch it. So there's a lot of things that are from the get go. Uh, you mean kind of for things that they're not uh, insurmountable by any means, but it, it is some obstacles in, in the path. Your, your point about a magazine highlight show or taking MLS 360 and trying to put that in more places, I, I think that's a good idea. I think it's something that. Uh, MLS 360, if you, if you watch it, for those who haven't seen it, if you watch it in terms of what it looks like, it looks incredible in terms of the studio, the presentation, the production. I mean, for me, on a Saturday night, I love seeing where they have, uh, you have four games on the screen at one time, and then they're talking you through it. Like, oh my gosh, did you just see that goal? Um, ben Teke scored in DC United, top left corner. And then within a minute or so, they'll go to that and show, show you that in more detail. So the concept of MLS 360 is fantastic. The presentation is great. Um, the games, I mean, some nights are better than others. Um, hopefully that can improve over time. But again, that's got nothing to do with Apple. It's got nothing to do with MLS Season Pass. It's got everything to do with the actual MLS front office and um, maybe spending some more money on, on, on bringing in some, some higher quality players or or the coaches or changes, you know, slowing down expansion, right? Or some something to figure out a way to make the regular season more meaningful where subscribers do sign up. Yeah, so, that, so as far as ideas go, I think the MLS 360 or a magazine highlight show, trying to get that out into more places so that people do see it. Uh, and your point and my point, Kartik, sometimes that may not do the trick. People might watch that and go, there's really not a lot happening. There's not a lot of stuff uh, here that's going to bring me back the following week. But it is what it is, right? It's it's transparent. Uh, they will show the best highlights, and, and maybe that'll be enough to get some people saying like, hey, you know what? This is a league that I believe in, and I, subs- I should subscribe to and try MLS Season Pass. And that's the other thing, to try MLS Season Pass. Um, yes, there are free games that are offered. And the, yes, MLS 360 is available for free to Apple TV Plus subscribers. Um, but I think that's a large part of it, too, is that right now, currently, there's no free trial to MLS Season Pass. So maybe in the future, maybe that's something that might happen. But that's something I think that's needed is almost every s- streaming service out there has a free trial. So you can... You can test it out for seven days or or less or more sometimes and really get a feel for okay is this something i, I really need on a regular basis so so i would say yeah i agree with you kartik in terms of um a magazine highlight show mls 360 or something like that pushing that out more and then trying to get, do some type of free trial but uh the point you mentioned about espn sports center and i would add to that espn fc is we're not seeing MLS highlights. I mean, I can't remember the last time I came across watching a sports program and seeing MLS highlights included, and that's something that needs to change. So MLS and or Apple needs to do a much better job of figuring out ways to make the, to, to actually distribute that content more freely so that uh, more fans out there can actually see what's happening in the league and, and then maybe then be enticed to go ahead and subscribe to MLS Season Pass. Chris, I don't know the answer to this, but are the documentaries, maybe you do, are the documentaries and some of the, the, the lifestyle type programs about clubs that we see on Apple Season Pass that you and I have access to because we subscribe to it, are those property of MLS or are those property of Apple? Because maybe MLS could get one or two of those on some sort of linear channel if they actually own the property. If Apple owns it, well, then I guess they're out of, you're out of luck. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I do not know the answer to that. But I would argue, I mean, I mean so uh, this, this past week I've had my uh, my cousin from from Wales, who now lives in the Netherlands, here with me. And uh, last weekend we watched MLS Season Pass, and I was explaining how it worked and explaining the Whip Around show, which he had never heard of before, the whole concept. And then I showed him... Um, um, was it Goal Zone? Yeah, I think Goal Zone with the Premier League the, the, the following day on the Sunday with Peacock and showed you how, showed him how how it how it did it there. Um, so he was really 
kind of like wow he's like this is incredible you got so access to so many games and yes so many of these games kick off at the same time this whip around thing is pretty cool but let, let's go back to which is his team let's go back to the leeds united against bournemouth match because i just want to watch that one but having the the possibility and accessibility and, and ease of use to go and pick and choose what you want to watch is fantastic um but going back to your question about who owns that content as far as those shows I'm not sure. To be honest with you, the Kartik, I don't think it really matters in what I'm, I'm going to say, which is uh, I sat down with my cousin and we also watched Welcome to Wrexham. He had never seen it before. So he's from Wales originally. Uh, he's from the same town that I'm from. So we sat down and watched, I think it was about the first six episodes. And he was hooked, completely hooked. He said, okay, as soon as he goes back to the Netherlands, He's going to subscribe to Disney Plus, which is that's where it's available on over there. And he's going to watch the rest of the series. And then he's looking forward to season two. And so that that's the, that's the difference. And him watching it, he knew the story about Wrexham, of course, but him watching it, his wife joined, joined in too and watched it. And the kids joined in and watched it. The way it's produced and the stories with the community is is top rate like some of the best television i've seen in a long time so well done almost as if it took them years to to kind of produce it to get it to such a great quality which obviously it wasn't but still really good and that's that's really what was missing thus far with mls season pass i think we were promised some of those things and yes i know they did a deal with um, the company that did the netflix f1 drive to succeed or drive to success series so mls will have something like that in the future but from the get-go right now there's really no oh my gosh you have to see this this documentary or this this film or this series or this behind the scenes footage on mls season pass i'm hearing none of that it's so so, yeah so there's opportunities here but that stuff takes time and money to create create um and we don't have it yet so probably a lot of that too kartik is that uh you and I covered this so extensively last year. We know how late that deal was signed. And then, relatively speaking, how little time, basically, what, six months, they had to pull this whole thing together. Um, and now we're kind of experiencing it where there's, I don't know, to me, not not any must-see content on there because, you I mean, they didn't have the time to do it. So what other things can they improve? I think I think one of the other things they can pro- improve um, to help increase subscri- subscriptions to MLS Season Pass is a team-only subscription. So if you're a fan of Atlanta United, and you and I, Kartik, have seen this so many times, there's so many fans of Major League Soccer teams that are fans of that team and couldn't care less about seeing any of the, those other games. So off, offer a team-only subscription Give them access to uh, MLS 360. Give them access to Atlanta United in, in this example. Every home and away game, um, and maybe make it a little bit, a little bit pricier. Maybe it's not. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not seven dollars a month, but maybe it's ten dollars a month. Um, and then give them access and give them what they want, right? Rather than trying to force feed them into having access to everything, which is what they don't want. They're not watching. But give them, you know, ten dollars a month and. Uh, Hopefully that solves that issue because we've heard that so many times. Anything else, Kartik, you can think of as far as any other ideas of how to uh, how to put some life back into MLS Season Pass and get, and get more subscriptions? No, I, I mean I think that they they probably need to uh, to go through the cycle of an entire off season where they're promoting it, which wasn't the case this year. And then if we're in this position a year from now, then. That might be the time to reassess or reboot, but I think they just have to keep going w- the way they're going right now, uh, and uh, uh, and hope uh, that the that the buzz about Copa America in 2024, and then the World Cup in 2026, and potentially a Women's World Cup in 2027 being hosted uh, in the United States uh, and uh, and in Canada uh, in terms of the uh, 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 World Cup also uh, will will help uh, stimulate subscriptions domestically and globally more eyes on the United States and on Canada and on North America as a result. So I have a few more ideas before we go to list the mailbag about ways to fix uh, MLS season pass um, in no specific order. But one of, one of them is to go ahead for the away games, 
right? Um, the home games, you get the choice of the national broadcaster or you, or the home local broadcaster. But it would be great uh, on the away games to have also have access to your your, your club's um, announcers. So, for example, Inter Miami oftentimes has Phil Shane and Thomas Rongan calling those games uh, for fans of Inter Miami. When they go on the road, um, you can only uh, say they play Columbus Crew. You can only listen to either the national broadcasters or the Columbus Crew broadcasters. And I would imagine it would be pretty easy for them to go ahead and make that into Miami uh, broadcasters or commentators available for the audio to have a Thomas Rongan or a Phil Shane call in that game too. Um, that and and that's something that it might be something that it was a transition period because I think a lot of MLS fans have been so brought up on regional sports networks where they're so used to hearing those local voices all the time. Um, that when it is an away game uh, in MLS, under MLS season pass, it's kind of a disconnect because the people calling the game on the national broadcast um, may not know as much about your team. And then the the local option is the the home team, whichever home team it is, say it's Columbus Crew, and, and they're very biased uh, towards Columbus Crew and probably against Inter Miami, just as one example. Some other ideas, I, th- I think... Um, I think there needs to be a price decrease. I think that, um, I mean, MLS launched this at the price of like, what, 15 bucks a month and $99 a year. Um, I think in the future, I mean, they should seriously consider maybe bringing that down a little bit in terms of the pricing. Um, and maybe just, just to kind of try to get more people in it and just to test that, see if that does work. Because that for some people, for a lot of people, actually, uh, that is an obstacle. Um, I'm trying to think, well, a couple more things. One thing is uh, communication. There's been virtually no communication from Apple or Major League Soccer about MLS season pass. So, I mean, all it could take is maybe a, like a weekly email or something talking about what new content is added to MLS season pass. Maybe there's a, a special profile on a LAFC player or whatever content is added. Um, it'd be nice to know about that. Also, maybe um, some news about um, MLS season pass, maybe some guest appearances. So if a Jesse Marsh or a uh, Alexi Lalas is appearing on the weekend, put that in the newsletter. You may let us know about that ahead of time. Uh, Also, maybe some tips or tricks, different features within MLS season pass. Did you know that it has this feature? Have you tried this things? So communicating with the audience and the subscribers so that they know uh, what options are available? Um, I think that would go a long way. The tricky thing about that is like who produces that, right? Because everyone that subscribes to MLS Season Pass, Apple knows their email addresses. Um, so Apple has a great way to communicate directly to those people and communicate. But is Apple the one that's going to put together that, that newsletter, or, or is it MLS? Um, and will MLS have access to all those email addresses? And you know, so, so those are things that could be worked out. But I think that's a big thing: is communication, explaining to people, hey, hey, if you have Apple TV Plus, you get MLS 360 for free. Or next week, here are the free games that are going to be shown this weekend. Two games available, um, two next week, and, and here's the games that are free to to kind of really kind of uh, basically test out uh, MLS season pass in more in more detail. Last but not least, Kartik, you mentioned this slightly too a little bit earlier, is advertising. I've seen so little advertising promoting MLS Season Pass, um, very little about driving home kind of the the major benefits. Or did you know that, you mean, if you have M- uh, Apple TV Plus, you can get MLS, uh, you can watch MLS 360, get people watching MLS 360 more and then hoping that they do subscribe to um, the actual MLS 3, uh, Season Pass. I will say, I have seen two commercials on television. One was a T-Mobile one for MLS Season Pass. And then another one was a, um, I don't think it was Mint Mobile, but it was another um, uh, telecommunications company, another cable um, cellular company. Both of those ads are horrible. (laughs) I mean, the target demographic must be soccer moms because it was really, really corny and cheesy. Both of them are really uh, low quality. So I think that's something you need, almost like the expertise of Apple and all of their marketing might, which I don't think we've seen. That we were we were promised that we were told that okay, this is going to be fantastic. Apple is going to, I mean, kind of uh, create connections with fans around the world, and um, there's going to be news served up here and there and everywhere. And I haven't seen. I mean, I haven't seen that. So 
maybe I'm missing out or maybe there's a whole world out there of stuff that they're doing. But again, include that in the newsletter that goes out to uh, MLS Pass uh, season, season subscribers. All right, Kartik, I think we're we're done with MLS uh, Season Pass for now. There are issues that need to be addressed. Um, there's a huge amount of improvement necessary. I'm sure that they'll make changes in the future. But right now, I'm... I'm concerned that um, things are not going as well as planned. And without having any numbers or metrics, it's difficult. But we know from our conversations and looking at the data that we look at, uh, it is certainly plateaued and um, improvement is necessary. So again, I think the root of this problem is not MLS Season Pass or Apple. I think it is MLS in general as far as their... The schedule, uh, the, the, pl- the playoff format, the regular season, the quality of the teams, uh, huge improvements are necessary. Let's move on to TV streaming news. Actually, no, let's go straight to listener mailbag, Kartik. Uh, we'll come back to that one next week. So first up is uh, Steve Chen, and he wants to talk about MLS and then promotion and relegation. Steve says, I, look, I listened to the pod and enjoyed the conversation. I wonder if it might behoove an ESPN-like entity to promote promotion relegation without Major League Soccer, create their own league with the pieces that are out there. Also, one U.S. sports league uh, uh, um, also, U.S. sports leagues create artificial jeopardy with playoffs and postseason tournaments. Uh, and U.S. likes the sports leagues to be a little bit more socialist than capitalist. Next up is uh, uh, NPOB1. He says the possibility of small to medium sized communities building a club and reaching a higher level is the real story of uh, promotion and relegation. Even the heartbreak of missing promotion is an amazing story. All the while, the quality of play improves from the bottom up to the top of the pyramid. Drew mentions, uh, he says, Kartik mentioned that there is no promotion and relegation in American sports. Regional MMA is a sort of promotion relegation. Uh, a hot prospect or champion on the, regular, uh, on the regional scene will often get called up to a major promotion. Scott says, uh, hey, guys, uh, first emailer, longtime listener. I really enjoyed one of your recent podcasts surrounding promotion and relegation. I believe it's one of the most misunderstood topics within the U.S. soccer landscape, and its complexities and obstacles are not always apparent. I do not support promotion and relegation in the U.S., and here are the main reasons why. Number one, it's a uh, poor financial model. It's no secret. Uh, soccer clubs do not make money. The greatest source of revenue and opportunity is typically in broadcast deals that pay out once or twice a year. This creates a huge strain on, on cash flow. Clubs such as Wrexham, who aspire for promotion, must assume the risk of any increase in spending. Why? Spending more money for better players is the only direct correlation we have to on-field success. What if this doesn't pay off? Too bad. Couple this um, risk with high travel cost, healthcare cost, and the current poor broadcast revenues, and it's a recipe for unsustainability. What does a financially prudent soccer pyramid with promotion relegation look like? Scotland. Would that be acceptable to a U.S. soccer fan base? Hell no. Uh, and, and then actually Scott goes into several other reasons why. I, uh, there's too many to actually read out uh, today. Uh, but Scott does close with uh, saying the background from him is he does support a lower league Scottish club, Dundee FC, and loves promotion and relegation altogether. I subscribe to the club's streaming package, and I'm a member of the fan community uh, group. I say this uh, so you know I'm not coming from a place of ignorance or arrogance, more so. I prefer promotion and relegation to be implemented the right way in the U.S. I love the podcast. Um, so the one, one response I'd have to that is... <clears throat> In theory, I agree. I mean, I think there are all kinds of uh, pitfalls with promotion and relegation financially, potentially for clubs. And we've seen it where clubs have chased a dream and have come up short and have uh, ended up uh, having major financial issues. And this is actually still an issue in Italy, right? Um, and particularly in, in the Italian football system. So I, I do relate to that. And I, and I have pushed back even on some of the arguments from people who are gung-ho about pro-rel and, 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 they, and they ignore those cases. However, the bottom line is we have a greater fail rate in the United States for professional clubs than in any other Western country or any other major, uh, let's include Japan and Korea in this, major industrialized country. And 
This is a byproduct of the closed league system. So uh, the other day I was talking to someone very prominent, um, a historic figure in the game, who um, uh, is for pro realm. And uh, he, he knows more than I do about the, the history of the sport in, in North America. Uh, and uh, it's actually someone associated with Rochester, since we talked about Rochester. It was the last podcast we talked about Rochester, right, I think? Um, so, uh, and uh, I said, hey, I think the fail rate's like 50%. For professional clubs in in the United States, it's that high. I, I, and and then he said, "No, I have the numbers. Uh, I, I've kept track of this for years. It's actually higher." So that's that's the issue. I mean, maybe both models have their pitfalls, and I think clubs. I, I think to to the point that um, that Scott's making. Yes, there will be issues uh, with sustainability with many clubs in a promotion and relegation system, particularly if the television side is not right, if you don't have the right media partner and media package, which chances are you won't have. We'll, we'll look, look at how much trouble we have uh, with MLS getting the right media partner or the right media package. But the bottom line is clubs are failing and failing and failing and failing in this country regularly because of the system. So clubs will still fail in a promotion and relegation system. I'm not under any illusion that no clubs will fail, um, but you'll have less clubs fail and you'll have less fans that are displaced. Uh, I'm a displaced fan. I've had I don't know how many clubs uh, I support that go out of business. And pe- people have asked me in the last uh, two weeks, I think really kind of arrogantly, why I don't watch uh, Inter-Miami, why I don't care about Inter-Miami, why, even though they play 10 minutes from me, why I'm still a fan of the USL team that plays 50 miles from me, or 40 miles from me, Miami FC, which is, of course, a club I work for. Miami FC is the only club I've rooted for in my life that I've been connected to that has not gone out of business in South Florida. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with them until they... they inevitably perhaps go under. Uh, and they're a club that's actually uh, uh, filed litigation, as I think most of our listeners know, to try and open the system up. So I have a loyalty to them because of that as well, and to their owner, Ricardo Silva. But that, uh, uh, let, let me just restate that. They are the only club I've ever supported in South Florida that has not gone out of business. Professional club. So uh, that's what it's like in this country, unfortunately, in this closed system. Yeah, and it's not just South Florida. We can look at any region in, in the United States, and I'm sure there's a long, long list of clubs that uh, that went out of business because of, of the system that's in place. And I agree with Scott. I think it's one of those things with promotion and relegation. Uh, it would not be something that would – I mean, the way it's done in other countries around the world, um, it would not flourish. It would not work in the United States. It would have to be changed and altered in a way to figure out a system that – because the, the country is such a big country – You'd almost need to have regionalized leagues or, or some type of different model where the, the travel expenses and a lot of the uh, the costs involved uh, would be decreased in order for to keep these these clubs um, financially solvent, um, but to give them an opportunity to to progress up up the leagues so that uh, or down the leagues if if they're not doing as well to have some system of accountability. I mean, looking at this weekend's fixtures, I mean, so the the games from the Premier League that are happening this weekend. For me, the the games that are most interesting, the games that I I will drop everything to watch, um, that I'm prioritizing are the relegation battles. So I'm watching, I mean, Monday for me is a big day. It's uh, Fulham against Leicester. Leicester with with an opportunity to try to get out of that relegation uh, zone. Brighton against Everton. Again, same thing with Everton. And then the third game, which to me is, to me, the, the biggest game of the weekend for me personally is Nottingham Forest against Southampton. These are two teams I have, I mean, no allegiances to. Uh, I have an interest in, in Forest because of their coach and have a lot of respect for the coach. But I'm watching these games as well as Big Sam, right? Big Sam returns. Um, if we had promotion and relegation in the US system, there's more of an opportunity and more of a likelihood. I mean, whether you love it or <laughs> hate it, but it's more like a likelihood that the coaches would get fired, and 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 then you'd have the accountability, and then you'd have like a a wild zany coach coming in at eleventh hour trying to save save a club from from relegation. But it's fascinating. I I, I will watch this game. I'll be glued to this game to see what happens. Hey, Chris, uh, uh, real quickly, uh, before uh, it might be dated by the time people listen to this, but there is still a possibility Southampton gets out of trouble. Yeah, for sure. Look at their look at their running. Yeah. Look at their running. Look at who they're playing. They probably have the most, and and the order of games also. It's not just who they're playing, but the order of matches. They have. I mean, there's seven points from safety, but 
it could happen. I mean, we've seen great escapes before, so don't don't automatically just think Southampton Forest is just uh, uh, it's just about Forest and Southampton's already down. Um, I, I uh, I'm not saying Southampton will get out of trouble, but it would not be the craziest thing, believe it or not. Just uh, I'm encouraging our listeners to go look at their fixture list coming in. So so the bottom team has. I mean, on paper, right, as far as the, the game's left, as perhaps the best chance of getting getting points. They may not stay up, but getting points. The team that has probably, uh, that has the, the toughest schedule in these last four games is the team that's sixth from bottom, which is West Ham United. And it's quite possible West Ham United might get no points between now and the end of the season. And I think they're at 34 points. It's po- and they have and they have two European matches too, so right. they're, they're in real. Right, yeah. yeah, so it's poss- It's quite possible they might get pulled. In. But but that going back to Scott's point is, um, yeah, promotion and relegation. If it did happen in this country, there would have to be some really serious conversations about how to make it work, how to make it because the, this country is so different. Um, however, to me, that the argument still stands that, you I mean. It gives a reason to watch these games. I mean, mo- most people don't care about in in the US don't care about Nottingham Forest, Southampton, but most people will watch this game. That 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 viewing number for that game might be is probably going to be higher than what MLS was getting last weekend on Fox, on Big Fox, on network television, which I think they got two hundred and seventy thousand people that tuned in to watch that game. This new uh, this Nottingham Forest against Southampton game will probably have more viewers on a Monday afternoon watching this game than that one, and it's not because we we all we all love Nottingham Forest and Southampton. It's because what this game means. This game is a massive six pointer. Uh, if Southampton wins this, yeah, right, you're right, Kartik. The rest of the fixtures don't look too bad. I mean, it's the, there's some winnable games in there. If Forest lose this. I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the manager, or the owner of Nottingham Forest, pulls a plug and says, "Hey, Steve Cooper, you're out. We're bringing somebody in for the last three games." As crazy as that sounds. Yeah, and he's an owner, by the way, at Olympiacos, which he also owns in Greece. He changes managers every six weeks. So I'm really surprised Cooper has lasted as long as he has uh, at Forest. I think there's some other factors there, right? Obviously, the director of football has been sacked, but, but the manager hasn't been. All right, uh, three more comments to go. Next up is Bill. Bill says, my friend has a conspiracy theory that the MLS-Apple deal only exists so that Apple can prove to the other major U.S. sports leagues that they can handle broadcasting a full league. Having all games be at the same time um, feels like a test for the NFL, Premier League, and Major League Baseball, since they all have multiple games scheduled at the same time. And let's not forget that multiple MLS owners also own teams in the other sports leagues in the U.S. and abroad. I think that's right. I think that's uh, 100% right, Kartik. I think that the set, the lack of sense of urgency that we're seeing from Apple with the the number of subscribers uh, signing up for MLS season pass. Yes, this is a a 10-year deal, so they've got plenty of time. But there seems to be a lack of sense of urgency, I mean, where most companies would be like, hey, we've got to make some changes. Things are not doing well in terms of numbers. We've got to shake things up. We've got to change things. They're thinking long-term, yes. But I think really their, their goal with MLS season pass is to prove the model. The model, having a global deal, no blackouts, a one subscription service, having people sign up and pay for it, and behind the scenes, more importantly, having having everything work, uh, working out the kinks, trying to figure out a, like a, a whip around show what what what's involved in terms of the production costs and and everything that has to happen, having local broadcasters as an option for the commentary, trying different things so that. Apple can go to any of these, right? NFL, Premier League, Major League Baseball, and other leagues from around the world and say, hey, we've we've done it. I mean, yes, the number of subscribers to MLS Season Pass may may not be, uh, I mean, kind of uh, meteoric numbers, but we've shown that we can go ahead and uh, broadcast a league to the world and have it work as a quality product, which the service itself... I think it is a quality product. The issue is not the, not the actual technology. The issue is the actual end product, which they have no control over. 
D- Bill, do you, does your friend work in the industry? Because I actually uh, have an industry source who had the same conspiracy theory um, and said the same exact thing. This is about proving to other leagues um, and, and, and in fact said, uh, I, I didn't mention baseball to me, but mentioned the NFL and Premier League. I said, oh, well, the Premier League just re-signed with NBC. And he said, well, the clock's already ticking on that. And uh, NFL is always um, – Always in play, um, and, and and it's the big enchilada. So uh, this industry insider said the same exact thing that this is this is the point because I was lamenting again the lack of promotion, the lack of effort, you know, not the lack of effort, the lack all the things we talked about earlier on this podcast to this person, and they told me this is Apple's trial run to prove to the NFL, to prove to the Premier League, maybe to the NBA also. Hey, uh, we're here, we can do this. Yeah, the, the big problem for Major League Soccer is I think the league thought that they were bigger than they were. So, I mean, they've seen the TV numbers, and yeah, the TV numbers haven't been great for many, many years. But still, they were considerable numbers, numbers that they were I mean, legitimate, great numbers. Attendance numbers we've seen, we've seen how those are. Um, so I think I think the league thought that this would be a greater success than it, what it is. But but for Apple, though, too, I mean, if they go to the Premier League in, in the next TV rights deal for the U.S., which is going to be, like, what, six years from now? Seems like so long uh, into the future, but uh, you, you never know. It'll be here before you know it at this rate. Um, I think in terms of the Premier League being such a global product and being so popular in the U.S. and, and, and abroad that – that that would be more enticing. That would be something that would be more successful because people already love the league, watch the clubs, um, and having a streaming service where no matter where you are in the world, and by that point in in six years from now, maybe it'll change in the UK where you can su- subscribe to the Premier League uh, channel on Apple TV and watch every single game. Maybe they'll get rid of some of those uh, the blackouts and the issues. But having that globally. It would be massive. It'd be absolutely massive, right? Not having to go ahead and subscribe to Peacock and um, Cable and or Fubo and or Sling, etc. I mean, it, it does simplify everything, and people would be willing to spend that. So, so the model. I don't think the mo- that, that's probably the biggest point out of this whole podcast, Kartik, Is I don't think the model is broken. I think it's just that MLS the product. Uh, is not generating the amount of interest that it that that it should be, and and maybe this is kind of a, a reality check for Major League Soccer to say, hey, wow, we thought we were bigger than we are. Um, yes, our, our hardcore fans are at the stadium, but outside of that, there's not a lot of interest. All right, two more to go. Dave says legally, closed leagues in the U.S. are on tenuous ground. An absurd Supreme Court decision from a century ago ruled that Major League Baseball is not engaged in interstate commerce because it just organizes local exhibitions. Courts often interpret that to mean that Congress needs to act to fully apply antitrust law to sports, but the NCAA cartel is being eroded, including by a unanimous Supreme Court. All it takes is the right plaintiff with the right facts if lower leagues in the U.S. had viable promotion and relegation, and if MLS and USSF pre- prevented access to the top league, there could be an Article Three case or controversy with tempting facts. Absent proof of concept, courts may instead prefer to keep punting to Congress. Yeah, so this is actually a very interesting point, Dave, because... Um MLS, I'm told, has structured their business in such a way that um, Orlando City, they would argue in court, is the Orlando branch office of a New York-based entity, so they're not engaged in interstate commerce. Um, that's what I've been advised about uh, by by. By a lawyer, yeah. Now I don't, I don't, I can't speak for NFL and, and NBA, etc. But that's what I've been told specifically about MLS to try and uh, comply uh, and 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 say that they're not engaged in interstate commerce the same way uh, MLB uh, is. So yeah, very good point. And I think you're right. Legally, they're on shaky ground, but that's the way it was argued to me at, at one time um, by a lawyer that uh, I, I, I had been in a firm that had represented MLS once upon a time. Yeah. And your example of Orlando um, also applies to all the other MLS teams around the country, uh, or oh, and, and Canada, right? So, ba- or basically, US for this for this uh, particular reason. But uh, is that the MLS clubs are a franchise 
of, of Major League Soccer or franchisee of Major League Soccer. That's the way it works. Actually, they're not. Legally, they're not franchises. Oh, really? So that's the distinction. Okay. They're disti- that's a distinction, yeah. MLS clubs are not franchises. That's a misconception. So MLS legally has tightened up their agreements with owner operators of the branch offices so to speak or the or the local clubs um usl is a franchise based league so the, that whole closed league thing could apply to them but no 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 the mls does not have franchises they ha- they're a single entity league with as i said I, i'm using the term because this is what this lawyer used branch offices not franchises okay. Because if it's a franchise, then it might be you might be engaged in interstate commerce. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. Wow. Okay, that, that's fascinating. All right. Last last point is from Chris. He wants to talk about MLS season pass. Just something he observed. Chris says, "I wanted to just point out that I have noticed that the audio and picture quality of MLS season pass broadcasts differs significantly depending on if I'm using an Apple device or not. For example, if I'm watching a game on MLS season pass on my Chromebook." There are more issues with picture quality and sound than if I'm using on my app, uh, iPhone or iPad. And I think that's, that those are good points because, uh, I mean, the Apple TV uh, app is, is, I mean, really it's built for the Apple ecosystem. So if you have an Apple device or an Apple, I mean, a phone or an iPad or, or an Apple TV, it's going to work better than it would be on a browser, which is in this case a Google browser. Uh, or basically any web browser. I mean, there's also even features and functionality and, and settings you can change within the Apple um, TV app or Apple settings. Uh, you can't do that on a browser, uh, no matter what type of browser you use. So, um, yeah, for me personally too, not just MLS Season Pass, but when I watch a game, it, it could actually it could be um, ESPN Plus. ESPN Plus uh, looks better and loads faster uh, on an Apple TV device, the actual hockey puck, the streaming device, than it does on Roku for me personally, or an Amazon yes. Amazon Fire TV Sa- stick. Same here. So another thing, uh, uh, Chris, uh, you need to know is that you're saying. Uh, obviously, you said if you're, it's different the picture quality if you're watching on an iPhone or iPad. There's actually a difference in the picture quality between the iPhone and the iPad, and the iPhone in many cases has a be- even better pi- the newer iPhones have an even better picture quality than the new iPads uh, there's some screen pixelation issue that I don't understand I don't understand the technical terms but I've been told about it uh, and read about it that 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 explains that so uh, so maybe the iPhone if you have a 14 or 13 or one of these new iPhones is the best way to watch it, uh, season pass if you don't have a hockey puck uh, uh, MLS uh, uh, Apple TV box okay Kartik before we go so the best way to explain Experience MLS Season Pass is to subscribe to MLS Season Pass for a year, ninety nine dollars. Have an either an Apple TV streaming uh, box, the, the hockey puck, the actual, and uh, an Apple iPhone, one of the latest models. And if you want to, you can get an iPad too. And then that way, you make sure that you've got the best experience, viewing experience, which is true, right? It, it you would get it would it would look fantastic. It would cost you probably close to a thousand dollars. Um, but but it would look fantastic. Yeah, and this goes back to the conspiracy theory that all Apple wanted to do was sell more hardware, and that's why they're doing a season. Pass. Actually, it might be, it's probably more than a thousand dollars with the the phone. Even once you factor in the cost of the phone, oh my god! All right, so listeners, uh, if you do want to give us any feedback on what anything we've said in this podcast, or if you have any questions or ideas or observations uh, about specifically TV and streaming, that's kind of our. our uh, our uh, expertise but it can go into other things such as promotion relegation or um the relegation battle or wrexham or you name it if it's soccer related basically let us know uh you can reach us via web well actually well actually through the website is uh worldsoccertalk.com uh click on the podcast um in the navigation and then leave a comment in the latest episode uh you can email us web at worldsoccertalk.com you can go to twitter and uh, tweet us at worldsoccertalk uh you can go to facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk send us a message through there uh voicemail 561-247-4625 and i think that's about it as far as all the options go uh, you can send me a letter if you want to but any of those Kartik, before we do go um where can uh, listeners uh, go ahead and read your latest uh, findings 
obviously you still write at worldsoccertalk.com with a weekly NWSL column, as well as uh, oftentimes observations and industry analysis about the TV streaming space. But if they want to read about lower league soccer, um, I mean, the, the promotion, relegation, there's so many different things going on. Where can they find your work? Yeah, at beyondthe90.substack.com. Uh, and uh, actually, this week we have an article that's gotten that's gotten some traction that Daniel Forrestine and I co-wrote about um, the, this, uh, uh, this kind of seemingly fake uh, promotion and relegation league that's being uh, touted by, uh, by, by some people uh, that, that's coming, that's supposedly coming to U.S. soccer. So you want to check that out, beyondthe90.substack.com. And then you can always find me on Twitter at KKFLA737. All right, listeners, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Uh, we appreciate your feedback and input as always. And uh, we hope you have a great weekend. And we will be back on Monday and Kartik, um with so much to choose from, right, from around the world. What are you going to be doing this weekend and what should the listeners do? Enjoy your football.